Hello, Chris Gettle here. Today I'd like to talk to you about how to modernize your patch management process. Now, patch management's been around for a very long time. Seems like it's a problem that uh, you know we may all have in hand, but uh, there's a lot of blind spots, there's a lot of challenges, there's a lot of changes that have happened in the past several years that make it more and more difficult to try to keep up with the overall managing of vulnerabilities within your environment. Today I'm going to talk to you about some of those challenges and how to better meet those uh, challenges in the market and try to get ahead of this problem. So continuous vulnerability management. This is the process of uh, continuously assessing, identifying, and remediating vulnerabilities within your environment. It can be a very tedious and exhausting process. It involves the security team, the operations team, and really it gets down to the fact that it is a bit of a race against adversaries out there. If you look at exploits that uh, exist within you know, the, the broader uh, ecosystem today, the average shelf life that threat actors are getting out of a, an exploited vulnerability, so if they've weaponized a vulnerability exploit and they're continuing to use it, they can get upwards of seven years of reuse out of an exploit. 50% of those vulnerabilities are going to be exploited within the first 14 to 28 days of patch availability. It only takes about a median 22 days for an attacker to develop a functioning exploit and weaponize it to be used. Now, let's go and look at a very specific example of uh, that timeline here to give you an idea of how realistic this actually is. You may all remember Blue Keep. Blue Keep was supposed to be the next WannaCry. This came, back, uh, uh, came out back in uh, May of 2019. So on the 14th of May, this vulnerability was, you know, made known to the world that it was, uh, an update was available. Uh, again, the uh, level of visibility around this was significant. There was a lot of publicity. There was a lot of uh, public interest in seeing this thing identified and resolved as quickly as possible. So we actually had a very interesting window into this exploit development process. Within 24 hours, uh, different research firms had did, started to develop their own POCs, their own functioning versions of an exploit of this. Both White Hats and Black Hats, by the way, were already starting to develop exploits of this. There were social media trackers. There were GitHub trackers. There were a number of projects that people were keeping tabs on. And what this allowed us to do was to be able to observe how quickly this process really does occur. By the 20th of May, only six days later, multiple research teams had confirmed the ability to basically execute a, a rudimentary attack against this vulnerability, which could end with the system that was being targeted, ending in a blue screen of death. Now, not a very ideal situation for a threat actor to actually weaponize and utilize in a, uh, an actual financial gains kind of uh, an attack, um, but definitely disruptive and showing how bad this vulnerability really was. By the 28th of May, there was active scanning of public systems. White hats and black hats um, were gathering intelligence about how bad this was across the world. Um, at this point, there were over a million uh, public-facing IP addresses that were vulnerable to this vulnerability at that point. Six independent research teams had confirmed and achieved a full exploit of Blue Keep, which gave them system-level access to those target systems. Um, so from this into basically being able to take it and uh, distribute um, either ransomware or some other type of uh, attack through that was just a minor step at that point. And that was 14 days exactly. So this is, uh, again, a real world example that we got to observe multiple teams developing independently. Um, a similar exploit of this vulnerability. If six you know, white hat research groups were able to do this, you can imagine that there were just as many, if not more, black hats out there that were exploiting the same vulnerability to identify how they were going to take advantage of it. Now, Blue Keep never became the next big WannaCry. WannaCry was kind of a, an example of a... Uh, well-executed but ultimate failure in a ransomware attack. It was too big, too fast, um, didn't have the infrastructure or the mechanisms to uh, accumulate payouts or anything like that. It, um, it basically was a very low payout in average, on average over a two-year span. 
it only netted, you know, somewhere around, uh, you know, two hundred fifty dollars to $300,000 versus current ransomware payouts that are almost that much, if not more, in single payouts now. Um, so it, overall, Blue Keep was not going to become another ransomware attack. What did end up happening was much more stealthy attacks were taking advantage of that. Crypto miners and other tools were taking advantage of this vulnerability. And you can assure that many organizations were using it to get into environments to then do other things. Now, again, 14 days. Um, it's a fast timeline for, for us to have to try to keep up with. The volume of vulnerabilities constantly coming out is also a challenge. So this, this visual is from CVE Details. CVE Details pulls data from the National Vulnerability Database and tries to help understand um, a bit more statistically, you know, what are we looking at? What are we facing? This is showing all of the vulnerabilities that they're currently tracking. Um, these are the ones that are not disputed, have been confirmed. Um, so it's, it's triaged a little bit. You know, we'll actually show a little bit later um, the total CVE count um, of known vulnerabilities out there. Um, it's much higher than this, um, but this is the pared down list of um, you know, non-disputed, definitely confirmed vulnerabilities. In here, you can see that roughly 12% of those fall into a CVSS 9 or above um, scoring. That is what um, CVE categorizes as critical. Um, high would be anything from seven to nine. Um, so that CVE, uh, you know, scoring of high and critical together accounts for, you know, about 32% of all vulnerabilities that were confirmed out there. So it's a pretty significant number. It seems like we should be able to focus on those top vulnerabilities out there. But I'm going to show you in a, in a second here how that could also lead us to a bit of a challenge. So time is a challenge. The volume of vulnerabilities is a challenge. There's some blind spots in our prioritization of vulnerabilities. That's another challenge. So already we're talking about three pretty significant challenges here around um, how to properly manage vulnerabilities. So we are uh, you know, in uh, 2021 between June and July. This is about a 36 day span between these two patch Tuesdays. Microsoft had 10 zero day vulnerabilities that they addressed. A zero day vulnerability meaning the vulnerability was known to be exploited before an update was made available. 10 vulnerabilities actively being exploited resolved in this 36 day span. Now in this time frame, most organizations were only worried about one in particular, which was called print nightmare. Um, obviously, most of us have uh, just recently been dealing with this. Um, you know, this is a, a very high profile vulnerability. It uh, got a lot of headline uh, coverage. It uh, got on the radar of many um, executive teams, boards, you know, other things. So this was the focal point of this. But there were nine other vulnerabilities actively being exploited at this time that also needed attention as well. So let's talk about those. Here's the list, the full list. And, you know, six of these were resolved on the June 8th Patch Tuesday event. The Print Nightmare was resolved on July 1st. And then three more were just resolved on July 13th, the July Patch Tuesday. Now, based on how organizations typically prioritize their remediation uh, activities, um, the operations teams in a lot of organizations may be saying, oh, hey, we're going to respond to only what's rated as critical. Okay, so here's a potential blind spot number one. If we're basing off of vendor severity and we're only responding to critical, we've just missed seven out of 10 of these known to be exploited vulnerabilities. All right, so let's go on to the next one. None of these were actually rated as a CVSS 9.0 or above, even Print Nightmare, which got so much headline coverage. So depending on how we're prioritizing, if our security team is saying, hey, anything eight and above, or if they're going for high end critical altogether, maybe they're going 7x and above, that might have gotten six out of 10 of these to fall onto the security team's radar. Print Nightmare, again, because of its headline grabbing uh, focus, became the focal point for most organizations. And in reality, 
they were kind of uh, somewhat uh, ignoring the other ones and focusing um, to almost all uh, ex exclusively on this print nightmare vulnerability. The only good news about this scenario is this all happened to be in the Windows OS. So the way that Microsoft packages it up and delivered these updates, we ended up getting all of these together if we prioritized any of them in these three update periods. So the June 8th updates to the OS, the July 1 out of band, or the July 13th um, Patch Tuesday release. Because this was OS level and everything is cumulative and bundled together, we did get all of these. But this points out a painful blind spot. Vendor severity doesn't take into account real world risks. CVSS score doesn't take into account real world risks. How can I tell between these different statistics what I should really be focused on? We can learn a lot from trends. There are social trends. There's uh, trends uh, amongst, uh, you know, uh, what we like from a movie standpoint, what we like from a media standpoint. Why can't we do the same thing with threat actors? What we can get from this type of view is we can get a better understanding of what's the low-hanging fruit that we can eliminate to take away the easy um, options that these threat actors have. Um, so in this example, um, this, this data is from RiskSense. Uh, many of you have uh, probably heard the recent news. Avanti has acquired RiskSense uh, recently, and to, we did so for a very specific purpose, to help our customers to help um, drive towards this risk-based level of remediation. And uh, in their content, they did this Q2 2021 ransomware index update. They found that there are 266 vulnerabilities specifically tied to ransomware families. These are vulnerabilities that are highly being utilized by these groups. You know, if you're using random ransomware as a service, if they've got off the shelf um, exploits that can be used in their toolkits. So out of those 266, 59% of them had a CVSS score less than 8.0. So again, going back to that blind spot, if we're prioritizing based on vendor severity or CVSS type details, we could be missing a significant portion of the overall risk. In this case, 157 out of those 266 vulnerabilities that are actively being utilized by these ransomware uh, attackers might have slipped by our notice. This is why they're e so easily able to take advantage of this is because we're, we're basically, we've got blinders on to the real world risks to our environment. All right, so let's talk about some more of these challenges. Once we've prioritized what's going on, how do we take that information and hand it off to operations to actually remediate and take action quickly? It's just a handoff, right? It's a report. All we do is we run that report and we give it to the operations team, we're good to go. In reality, it has a lot of complications. Each vulnerability assessment could contain tens or even hundreds of thousands of detected vulnerabilities. In most cases, you know, if there is an Adobe Reader update, that could resolve 20 or more CVEs in one single update. The operations team is looking at 20 some CVEs per system that's running Adobe Reader. And in reality, they're just, you know, looking at and having to deduplicate and figure out, okay, how many of these get taken care of if I push this application? How many of these get taken care of if I push the latest OS update? If any version of software is even a couple of versions out of date, that can accumulate very quickly. And again, the vulnerability assessment says, oh, hey, you've got 20 vulnerabilities on the latest version, 15 on the previous version, 23 on the previous version again. All of those together is what the vulnerability report shows you. Well, in reality, there's a single update that can be pushed to take care of all of those vulnerabilities in one shot. So how much time does that take? Deduplicating, researching, understanding, is this list of vulnerabilities resolved if we take these actions? Most organizations burn a full day or more in that effort. In fact, I was just talking to a, a, one of our global customers, a very large organization. Um, they're trying to figure out, and by the way, I wasn't talking to the operations team, the ones that were actually doing the patching. I was talking to the security team, the team that's helping to understand what they're going to prioritize. That team is burning over a day worth of time, just trying to get the right information to tell operations, here's exactly what needs to be done. They'd like to 
speed up that process. So they were they were asking us, okay, you guys pulled together all of this content from things that you do in like your Patch Tuesday webinar and information that we can pull from there. How can we get that information sooner? Because we're, you know, as a global organization, we've got to go tell teams to get started on this. We're basically telling them sometime late Wednesday what they need to be doing. We'd like to tell them late Tuesday. So the day of the Microsoft Patch Tuesday release still. So they're trying to save a full day in there. And it's all coming down to just this mapping exercise. It's data. It's hierarchical. It's able to be mapped. So we've got all of those CVEs listed in our patch catalog. We've got APIs to be able to interact with and pull that information in. And in a matter of a couple of minutes, we can help to map a significant amount of that information. So again, as we start to look at these challenges, where can we automate and optimize to save time? Out-of-band responses. Here's another area where we all, all over the industry really have to change our mentality. If you remember back in the March, April, May timeframe, there were some back-to-back -back, um, you know, uh, updates for Exchange, starting with Hafnium targeting Exchange server, uh, targeting a few zero days that were identified there. It was a pretty nasty attack. It was very easy for them to get in. And once they got in, it was very hard to detect. It was even harder to remove. Print Nightmare, again, many of us still just coming off of um, all of that situation between um, you know, the, uh, the, the vulnerability that was identified originally in June, the new vulnerability that was confused in there because there was a June vulnerability that was relating to the print spooler, a second vulnerability that actually became Print Nightmare um, in the out of band in July 1st, and a third one that's still suspected to be hanging out there potentially. Um, but all of that was a very quick response that organizations had to do. Many of you may have done similar to what we did, where we turned off the print spooler across devices, across the entire, uh, uh, you know, company-wide, uh, all systems turning off that print spooler. Sorry, we're not going to let you print in the next, you know, little while here while we wait to resolve this vulnerability because it was so threatening. Um, this type of situation, when you respond in an out-of-band manner, it's very disruptive, it's very unorganized, it's, it's a little bit clunky in its execution. If you respond in terms of a swarming exercise, you can actually be better prepared for these types of events. Google Chrome had eight zero days so far in 2021. How many of those did your organization drop everything and respond to? Probably not as many. Um, they didn't reach as many headlines, but they were, you know, some pretty nasty stuff as well. Apple just patched a zero day at the end of July here that affected iOS, iPad OS, and Mac OS. Um, you know, again, how do we better respond to these types of situations? And we're going to talk a little bit more about the swarming mentality, but um, similar to any other type of disaster recovery or, you know, rehearsing scenarios like that, Shifting to a swarming mentality means that your organization knows how it's going to self-organize around the response. You're going to have designated people who know that if they're the core of this swarm response, they're dropping everything to focus on this, and that is their top priority until it's executed. Anybody who's identified to support that core swarm team is, uh, you know, whoever's the key responder there. Anybody added to that to be a supporting role knows that they're engaged until this is resolved as well, and it is their top priority. So let's go back to the Hafnium Exchange vulnerability. If we were approaching this from an out-of-band perspective, suddenly this comes up, the Exchange team is told, hey, you need to go do this right now. And all the pressure's on them. They're getting bombarded with uh, questions from a whole bunch of different groups. They're not getting very much support from anybody to help deflect and uh, you know organize responses to things so they're distracted from the actual resolution by trying to give report outs constantly throughout this process of what's going on are we in, uh, infected are we you know a swarming mentality the exchange admins hey you're going to focus on this and nobody's going to interrupt you just go do this this is the person you're going to be working with on the security team who's going to be helping you to understand exactly what we need to know about detection 
and clean up if there's anything going on there. This is the person in communications who's going to be the point of contact for any status updates and anything else. You give them those status updates. Here's the frequency we want them. They're the point of interface for the broader organization and stakeholders so that you, the exchange admin, can focus on getting this resolved. That's the swarming mentality. If your organization organizes in this swarm methodology, you can be better equipped to deal with any out of band that comes. All right, so let's let's bring a couple of things together here. We've talked about exploited vulnerabilities. There's also public disclosures, meaning things that have been uh, identified to the point where threat actors have a jump start on us. This could be things like what happened in the Ponda own conference, uh, conference earlier this year. Several exchange vulnerabilities were showcased in there. Those were resolved over the course of the next couple of months by um, uh, different groups uh, that identified those. Um, this was made aware enough for threat actors where they could try to take advantage of those as well. So public disclosures need to be something else on our radar just besides those exploited zero days. Unknown vulnerabilities in general are also a concern. Some vendors don't disclose that they're resolving vulnerabilities as clearly as others. So any outdated software, assume it has a shelf life. Software is very much akin to milk. Milk is going to spoil in your fridge if you don't use it in a good time. Um, software just left untended also has a shelf life. If it end of life, if it has updates that could be applied that haven't been, each of those could be introducing risk of vulnerabilities that were either not emphasized, not disclosed, or uh, still unknown that have been resolved by updates that have happened in there. We need to be aware of those and keeping up to date with it. So day zero, an update releases. We talked about that 14 day window where uh, an exploit can be developed by that. That means that first two weeks is very important. The faster we can move, the better we're going to be at closing down that risk. So can we patch our servers quarterly? Well, that that's way behind us. You know, Most organizations that did quarterly are no longer doing that monthly. This is the, you know, a lot of companies are still doing a monthly kind of uh, patch regimen. What we need to focus on is how do we get to weekly? Now, we can optimize for that. There's obviously critical infrastructure that we have to get more into a monthly predictable cadence and only respond out of band in that swarm mentality when necessary. But for most end user machines, and especially machines that are more high risk, can we get into a weekly cadence? So let's talk about some ways to shorten that time to patch. Identify and automate the bottlenecks. We talked about prioritization. Once prioritized, how do we quickly get to actionable remediation? Just a simple integration of taking those CVEs, mapping it to the data, we can help to automate a full day out of your process by doing that. Shorten those test cycles. Have clearly communicated stages. So, you know, this is the, our patch automation and rollout projects capabilities that we have allow us to um, create stages. In that first stage, you've got pilot users who are, are engaged there. You can have those that pilot group be patched in, in a certain period of time very quickly, and you can have those stages communicated out so people know their role in that stage and what type of feedback you need to close that stage out and move to the next. If you do these things um, uniformly and uh, um, you know cleanly, that pilot group and uh, you know those critical applications that you're more concerned about within your organization that oftentimes become the detriment or the barrier to getting patch management executed properly can be smoothed over and eliminated as far as pain points. So shorter test cycles, clearly communicated stages, more user participation within those stages. Utilizing crowdsource patch testing and telemetry. For those of you who are aware of our patch intelligence solution, well, we'll be talking about that more in a little bit here. This includes two key things um, that many organizations struggle to try to pull together. One, it has um, patch reliability information. So we can pull telemetry from multiple customers across our environment. If a Google Chrome update comes out, within 24 hours, there could be thousands of machines that have pushed that update out and we can provide you some high-level visibility into how that's performing. 
social media, once again, kind of allows us to be able to get a read on how reliable uh, an update is as well. So we've also been uh, pulling from a number of sources like Twitter and Reddit um, to figure out social sentiment around an update. With this, we can tell out of a group of updates, you know, is there one that's broken away from the pack and is being talked about more than any other? In that case, does that, uh, what's the sentiment around that? We can pull a couple of key, um, you know, phrases and things that people might want to know about. Um, you know, uh, either, you know, usually it falls into two categories. One, it um, it's operational or it's security related. Within there, is it resolving a security vulnerability that's high profile? That's something that you definitely want to be aware of. Okay, this has urgency because of that. If it's in the operational bucket, then it kind of falls into two subcategories. Is it operational and fixes something that was really painful? Hey, it fixes a known crash or it fixes a, you know, a printer issue or whatever, or does it cause an operational issue? So from that sentiment, we can identify patches that are breaking away from the pack and being talked about more, and then get down a little bit into the details of what exactly is that being talked about and why. Classifying applications that need to be done more frequently, Google Chrome, Adobe Reader, um, you know, browsers, uh, PDF readers, um, OS updates. These are ones that if those are um, being exposed by a, an out of band or a zero day, that's one we want to uh, respond to more frequently and possibly get into that weekly cadence for. Formalizing a swarm response versus out of band. Again, the distinction seems about it really, very slight, but when you rehearse practice and everybody knows their role, when an emergency occurs, you respond better overall. One thing that we're going to you know, be shifting towards more and more long term is just in time response. So can you patch systems just in time if it's necessary? All right. So let's talk a little bit about um, risk based vulnerability and patch management. So really, in reality, there's over 200,000 unique vulnerabilities out there. How many of those are easily patchable, meaning they're available within a patch management solution like Ivanti? Um, it's a smaller subset. And the reason for that is, well, there's a lot of configuration uh, vulnerabilities. There's a lot of uh, vulnerabilities that exist within um, technologies that you can't update easily. Um, so uh, polycoms have a lot of vulnerabilities, but you can't really patch a, a polycom very easily with uh, you know any off-the-shelf patch management solution. Um, trying to patch a um, a large, complicated, critical application like um, SAP or Oracle's database or you know other middleware or tiered applications, those aren't things that you can just apply a patch easily to. They're projects that need to be executed. Web services and other things like that that may need to be patched or have cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. A lot of time, there's development toolkits and other things involved there. So there's out of all vulnerabilities out there. What's easily patchable is low-hanging fruit. These are the things that you can eliminate very quickly. So how many of the vulnerabilities total have been weaponized? 25,000 uh, plus um, to date is important for an organization to understand. How many of those are capable of remote code execution, meaning the attacker can execute code against that vulnerability without having to be on that system uh, themselves? They don't have to have persistent access yet. Um, and then how many of those are trending amongst, uh, you know, different types of threat actors like ransomware threat actors? If we can start to identify and work towards that, the things that are critical for an organization to understand can be taken care of first and foremost, and then you start to work back into the larger and larger buckets over time. So this is not a new concept. It's been around for a little while now, shifting towards this better prioritized risk-based perspective. Um, Gartner did some analysis on this, and they were basically uh, looking at this market and saying that by 2022, organizations that are using risk-based vulnerability manage, uh, ma management will suffer 80% fewer breaches in the course of a year. Um, that's a pretty significant uh, reduction in risk to your environment. Think about how many data incidents you had um, previously, um, you know, in a one year span, if you could reduce that by 80%, that's pretty valuable. The risk based patching angle, this is getting into that more prioritized, actionable, um, you know, quick action type of uh, uh, threat intelligence that you need 
from an operational perspective. Uh, the operations teams typically have to rely on security and uh, um, you know stacks of a lot of data coming together to be able to get to this level of data. At Avanti, and one of the reasons that we did we um, have this uh, acquisition of RiskSense is we believe this is something that security needs. The RiskSense products, pri prioritization, um, you know, risk-based vulnerability management from that broader perspective, but it's also something that needs to cross over and be natively available to the operations teams. So you uh, you, you will see integrations like this in our patch management uh, solutions in Avanti Neurons going forward as well, starting with our patch intelligence release um, in July here. Avanti Neurons for risk-based vulnerability management. So this is the risk sense solutions. This is that um, ecosystem of infrastructure scanners, application and code scanners, asset management data, manual findings from pen testers or bug bounty programs, other things like that. Bringing that together all in one system to try to get that prioritization, get the contextualization of that data, how understanding that data segmentation, the actionability, the reporting information that you need to be able to see this, and then start to automate um, playbooks and workflows to take action on these things. Um, so this is what the broader risk-based vulnerability management brings together. Again, going from that patch management, the low-hanging fruit, to the larger all vulnerability perspective is very important for organizations to fully achieve risk-based vulnerability management. So um, summarizing this real quick, um, four key takeaways from today's conversation. Risk-based prioritization. Traditional models like vendor severity, CVSS, don't account for real world risk effectively. We need to have better metrics. We need to focus on real world risk to our environment. By doing this, you could be reducing up to 80% of data incidents that data breach incidents that would happen in the course of a year. How do we get to faster remediation? Speed is of the essence. 14 days is all that they need. Sometimes they exploit a vulnerability before the vendor even knows about it. Those zero days need a quick response as well. We'll talk about that in the next bullet here. But that faster remediation, how do we improve that time to patch? How do we automate and remove more of those steps that are taking the time that, you know, we're basically losing time in resolving these risks in our environment? If we've got prioritization optimized and we've got faster remediation under that 14-day window, we've significantly removed a whole bunch of risk from the environment already. Now let's talk about those out of band, those zero days, the vulnerabilities that, oh, you know, print nightmare just came out. Oh my God, what do we do? How do we get ahead of this? How do we adopt a better swarm response versus traditional out of band response? Out of band responses are typically very painful, disorganized and uh, disruptive to the organization. If we have organized and rehearsed around this swarm response mentality, we optimize for quick and timely resolution in an efficient manner. Last, you know, the future of where we're going. How do we optimize for just-in-time patch remediation? Um, you know, you should be able to automatically respond if you've got a threat model that you've defined, um, an, a zero-day vulnerability, known exploited comes out, systems within my environment are basically looked at and said, okay, if I've got a system that is in contact with a critical application that is very sensitive to my organization, has PII, PHI, whatever type of sensitive data on it, um, that makes it so that that system falls into that threat model. And if that threat model hits a, a red flag, remediation needs to be automatic. Um, can you make it so that a user who is using that critical application, if a zero day comes out in Google Chrome, the next time they try to launch Google Chrome, it pops up and says, nope, this is a, um, a risky version of the product. There's a known exploit in this. We need you to update this right now. So here, Mr. User, click here, it'll update you. Can we provide that type of just-in-time response to a threat model that's been defined within our organization to help us reduce these risks down to not weeks, not days, but even hours from identification of an exploit being available to remediation within our environment. 
All right. I hope this was helpful. Um, there's going to be more about uh, risk-based vulnerability management and patch management. And uh, hope to see you again here on uh, some additional sessions in this series in the future.